pleasure of introducing Randall here. Other than having an epic beard, and we have a lot of those here in Portland, um, he's been doing UI design since the mid-80s. Um, he really got my attention a few years ago when he proposed a talk on prototyping that was practical paper prototyping at a technical conference. Um, he included a duck joke that I really didn't understand, a reference to Frank Herbert and his dad's Tandy 1000. And he also stepped through prototyping useful websites on paper. It's kind of awesome. Back in April, Randall stood up in Amsterdam. And how many of you here were actually at the Amsterdam conference? Oh, yeah, I got a few of you. Nice. So you're going to see part two here today. Um, but he stood up and said that Puppet's user experience sucked. Since then, <laughs> he's been hard at work. Um, and that's what he's going to share today, the state of user experience at Puppet. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the duck joke that Selena doesn't remember or didn't understand, I'm just going to free give it to you for free. Why did ducks have little flat feet to put out forest fires? Right. Why do elephants have big flat feet? to put out flaming ducks. There you go. So, <clears throat> um, I am running Keynote with this thing. I'm not checking Twitter or texting my wife. So with any luck, it'll work. Uh, I have great news for everybody. Um, at Puppet, we are intentionally uh, starting to take user-facing design more seriously. Um, and this is really exciting for me. And it should be exciting for everyone out here using Puppet. When I say we, I say we advisedly, not me, because as Luke says, there are 55 of us now. And as one designer, I am a drop in the bucket. It doesn't really matter what I think about design or user experience. I need to be able to convince other people and to be able to work with other people. So this is a company effort. Um, and to the extent that I have a theme today, that is the theme, that the user experience in Puppet is a reflection of the work that we do as a company. It's not the reflection of me. Um, and as our user experience improves, uh, that means that we are becoming a better company. <clears throat> so I'm here today because of my dad, um, which is the biggest photo I've ever seen. He was a good-looking guy. Uh, he, uh, <clears throat> he never saw this, this uh, meth biker Ming the Merciless look that I'm, I'm rocking right now. So I don't know what he would have thought of that. Um, he saw me in the 80s, or in the 90s, my goth days, the, the Bella Lugosi's dead look, as Nigel calls it. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, we're all here because of our dads one way or the other, right? Uh, but for me, it's very direct. Dad was an industrial engineer who worked for Goodyear for 35 years. This is back when having a career and a job could actually be the same thing. Um, and the most valuable thing that he taught me was that anything could be hacked. Anything could be taken apart and put back together again, and sometimes it even works. And so if something mechanical or electrical broke around the house or stopped functioning optimally, he would give it to me. And I would have great fun taking it apart, trying to put it back together, trying to figure out how it worked. Um, I learned a lot of things this way, like how a capacitor works and why you shouldn't touch it. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and the other thing that Dad did was, in 1986, bought a Tandy 1000S SX, the mythical Tandy 1000. And um, he was 62 when he got this computer, but he really embraced it. He loved it. And he spent a lot of time working in this, what we would today call an office suite or a productivity suite. I don't even remember what it was called then. Uh, doing word processing and budget spreadsheets and all that jazz. And he liked to print in this tiny font on the stop matrix printer because he was a control freak with great eyesight. And you had to get out of the uh, office suite and show him to QBasic and run a bunch of weird commands and then get back into the office suite and try to print and hope it worked. Because you get no feedback, right? Either the command worked or it didn't. You didn't know until you printed on this slow dot matrix. And I heard him swearing at this thing once. That's the other thing he taught me is how to swear. And I said, self? I can solve this problem, and so I did. I whipped out the QBasic manual, and I wrote a little program, and I called it Dad. And I remember the look on his face the first time he ran this. He typed Dad, he hit Enter, and it just worked. I didn't have to think about it anymore. This is a problem that was solved once and for all for him. And since then, I've been hooked on that very thing, on that feeling, that feeling of solving someone else's problem and solving it well. Um, so that's why I'm here. That's where I come from. <clears throat> um, I'm going to be talking about three things today. I'm going to talk about what we're doing at Puppet UX-wise. 
And uh, some of that is going to sound very similar to what a certain CEO said, uh, but that's because we agree. Um, but I'm also be going to be talking about how and why we do these things. Because I think that as a crowd of sysadmins, you're, this, a lot of this UX process is probably fairly mysterious. Um, and I don't want it to be that way. I want it to be open and upfront. This is work that uh, we're not doing for our own amusement, we're doing for you. So I want, to be, I want you to be able to keep me honest. If you come six months from now to a conference and you say, you said you were going to do this thing, and you weren't doing this thing, that's the kind of feedback that I'd like, and that's what I hope to get from being open about it. <clears throat> um, I'm going to try to blow through this quickly and leave time for questions, so we'll see how that goes. And I'm going to do this in perversely reverse order, uh, why, how, and then what. So why? Why you exit Puppet? This is what my friends asked me eight months ago when I told them I was going to Puppet. Those who knew what Puppet was, uh, there are plenty of people who didn't know what Puppet was, and they gave them the one-minute spiel, and then they started asking me why. You work on the web. You do GUI design. Where I work on a systems tool. Isn't this just computers talking to other computers? And I said, you know what? Yeah, a lot of Puppet does happen on the command line. But that's great news for me, because for 25 years, I've been victimized by crappy command line interfaces, and now it's payback time. <clears throat> Um, so there's a serious answer, though, which is there is a lot of UX at Puppet. There is the command line interface where a lot of us spend our lives and do all our work. Um, but there's a graphical user interface as well. We've been doing a lot of work with that lately, and we're trying to improve. Um, there's the DSL, the Puppet language, and uh, there are various APIs. The internal Ruby API, where you can theoretically do the same things you can in the DSL, and there are the REST APIs. And the XML RPC APIs, which we're not going to talk about because they're going to die soon. So what holds these things together? What's the common thread? For me, the common thread is quality. Um, there are all sorts of people with Puppet who care about all sorts of things, marketing, sales, ops, all these people are fantastic and I love them. Um, but the banner that I try to fly, the, the flag that I wave around all the time is user-facing quality. It's not that I don't care about anything else, it's that this is the space I like to inhabit. And regardless of what we do, for whom, or why, or in what context, I want us to be building high quality work. Um, Luke likes the 80-20 rule. I like the 100% rule. I want us to ship something that's awesome. Um, so between the 80-20 and the 100%, hopefully we can have a meeting of the minds um, and can continue to improve this quality. <clears throat> now, quality is not a goal in and of itself. I've read Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I like quality itself as much as anything. But quality is instrumental. Quality is a way of getting to something else, something more important. And that thing is joy. And I know this is particularly surreal, so I'm talking about joy on the command line. Um, <clears throat> but quality is my path to joy, right? Everyone knows the experience of using a quality product, something that feels like a cohesive whole, something where you don't see any rough edges, where there's a consistent interface to it. Um, and that's what I hope that we can achieve in Puppet. A great user experience is joyful. <clears throat> so I've said user experience a few times. Um, which is what the kids are calling it these days. Don Norman at Apple uh, started calling it user experience in the 90s, so it's still a relatively new term. Um, and in the wrong hands, it can be misused just like Agile and Scrum and any other weird thing. Um, so left to its own devices, it can be very grandiose. And what it can mean, what it should mean, is your journey, your path through all of Puppet, from first hearing about Puppet to downloading a tarball and installing it to coming to this conference to hear people talk and network and learn more about it. Uh, and it's not just your physical path through it, but it's your perceptions of that path. Now, this can be a problem because it's easy to optimize for perceptions. That's the lazy way to do it. Optimize for perceptions rather than reality. This is uh, brand curation. I remember reading an article years ago about the people who do brand curation for the Pillsbury Doughboy. Arguing, yeah, there are people who mind the Pillsbury Doughboy. That's their job, arguing about whether he should giggle a certain way in uh, a commercial when he gets touched, whether that's out of character or not. Um, so if I sold my soul, we could do this kind of work. I could say, how does this screen make you feel? <laughs> what about this one? <clears throat> a little more cheerful, don't you think? Be like the autometrist, A, B. Which do you prefer? <clears throat> but you know what? This isn't design. This is decoration. This is style. This is the antithesis of design. Um, <clears throat> good design could prevent this error. Good design could at least make the path to it more difficult. Good design could make the error easier to read. Good design could at least give you the error once instead of six times. Stealing time 
through crappy design is the worst sin that we have available to us. And user experience design saves your time, your most precious resource, the only thing that you never get back. That's why it's real, and that's why it matters. <clears throat> so what does it mean to be a design-driven company? This is something that Luke and I have been talking about for a while. <clears throat> My notes aren't coming in on this thing. So uh, we'll have to see how this goes. The first thing it means is focusing on the user, uh, focusing on the real human being who needs our product. And the very first thing about the user is the user is not us, and we are not the user. And the perfect illustration of that is Nigel Kirsten here, who uh, worked for Google managing umpteen million nodes with Puppet and came to Puppet bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and with a few months had gone completely native. It's like, users, pff, heck with them. Um, <clears throat> they got a problem. I don't care about that problem. I know how this bug behaves. I know what the workaround is. Um, I don't literally mean to, to parody Nigel that way, but the truth is that things look different from the inside. Um, if I know why a bug happens and I know what the workaround is or I know that there's a fix for it, it's not really as frustrating to me as it is to you out in the world getting chomped in the ass by this bug all day long. I don't know if I can say that word. Maybe it'll get bleeped out. Um, <clears throat> so we don't have the same skin in the game that you do. Uh, and that's why we need to communicate with you constantly to be reminded to help us build empathy for the real problems that exist in the world. Now, the other thing about the user is it's not a user. Our user base isn't homogenous. It's not monolithic. There are many different types of people who use Puppet, who get value from Puppet. <laughs> um, there are people who use Puppet today. There are people we hope will use Puppet in the future. And this can become very difficult to talk about, right? Because all of us, to some degree, really are special and unique snowflakes. And so we could say, well, there's the Nitro user, there's the Deepak user, there's the Nick user. And after a while, it just becomes a little nuts. So user experience has a really good tool for dealing with this problem. Uh, and that tool is personas. Uh, persona is a decision-making tool. Let's say we're having a conversation about building a graphical user interface feature. And we're aiming this feature at people with fewer than 100 nodes who don't know the Puppet DSL and are probably not going to learn it in the near future. They don't know really the difference between Puppet and M Collective. They just know that Puppet will hopefully help them manage their stuff. And let's say we create a persona. And that's everything we know about this persona. We call him Joe. Well, now we can have conversations about him. Um, I can say to a developer, or a developer can say to me, you know what, Joe doesn't know the difference between Puppet and M Collective. So if we use M Collective to perform a certain action on the server, overriding a managed resource, and 15 minutes later, Puppet runs in enforce mode and switches that resource back, Joe's going to be completely confused because he doesn't understand that there's a left and a right hand to Puppet. He's just going to think it's Puppet's fault and Puppet sucks. <clears throat> um, so it's important that we can have these same types of conversations, that we can talk back to this common reference point of a persona, because when it comes down to it, design is making decisions on the behalf of other people. And everybody who works on Puppet does design on Puppet. <clears throat> regardless of title or position, regardless of where people feel like they are in the food chain or hierarchy or whatever it is, um, the user experience at Puppet is nothing more or less than the sum of all the small decisions that people make every day working on Puppet. And there are hundreds of them. When I say I'm designing this thing, I literally mean I am making decisions about it. I'm making decisions so that you don't have to. And that can be a scary thing. That is one of the common knocks against Apple products, right? They're shiny. Apple makes a lot of decisions so that we don't have to. And it's easy to feel like they're making a lot of decisions so that we don't get to, so that we're not allowed to. It can be too limiting. The decisions that Apple makes, Apple make, the decisions they make work for me, um, which means that their design succeeds for me, for the part of their audience that is like me. Um, and the decisions that don't work for me are bad decisions from my perspective. And this is what we mean by design. It's completely empirically verifiable. <clears throat> so how do we actually make these decisions? First of all, we start with product and UX, with um, me and Nigel, the Wonder Twins. right? And what we like to do, what we hope to do, is provide to uh, people working on a particular feature um, the who and the why. Uh, and if the who comes in the form of a persona that's documented and people have conversations about, so much the better. Uh, and the why needs to be 
uh, a short list of goals uh, that the WHO needs to fulfill. Joe wants to make ad hoc changes to his network in a centralized way um, without worrying about things falling over. Oh man. So Nigel's been sick, so I know he's not leaving because he hates me. Ah, <clears throat> oh, damn it. Hey, I hope you feel better, man. <clears throat> So if we set the who and the why, then we're setting a manageable context for research and development to do the work. Um, this is a bit of a, uh, a foreign field, a foreign affair for a lot of people who are engineers or systems administrators. Um, it's hard to do ethnographic research if you're not used to it, for instance. Um, and so if we can narrow the scope of the work that they need to do and of the decisions that they need to make, then we can empower them to make good decisions within their context. <clears throat> So that's the user part. Um, what's the experience part? How do you get inside someone's head? This is notoriously difficult. The experience part is actually very easy to solve, and it is with user testing. Uh, who's actually who's done a usability test or been exposed to a usability test? So very few of us. All right. Um, a usability test can be like user experience or anything else. It can be Lard it up, you can have two-way mirrors and lab technicians and white coats and all that stuff, but the core of it is putting someone in front of a product and say, let me watch you use this. There's a big difference between a usability test and a focus group. Focus group is asking people what they think. You know, do you like this color blue? Uh, how does this command line make you feel? Uh, I don't really care what people think. What I want to know is how people behave, because that's the thing that doesn't change. Right? As primates, as people, we are remarkably consistent and constant in our behavior. Um, and so we have to build products for the way people really behave, the way people really act in the world, not the way we would like them to. And that's what a usability test will help tell us. The point of a usability test is to find problems in a product so that you can fix them. Uh, I know plenty of UX people, and there's a special sort of hell for people who go into a big company. They have this fantastically equipped usability lab with the aforementioned one-way glass, and they run all these big tests, and they fire off these reports, and they go nowhere, and the product never changes. Um, this is a travesty, especially because these people are spending so much time and energy and resources on this problem. It's easy to do a short, simple usability test with somebody. Um, but when you do it, it makes a big difference. Selena was talking about paper prototypes. I can whip up a paper prototype in five minutes and put it in front of someone and say, where do you think you should click to accomplish this task? And that tends to work very, very well. People will suspend their disbelief and they'll treat a paper like it's an interface. Excuse me. I was doing a usability test for a mobile app 18 months ago uh, with a paper prototype. And after a few screens of this, people would start trying to swipe the paper and be surprised when the paper moved. Um, so it's, and it surprises me. <clears throat> so if we're gonna make changes to an interface, this is where we wanna make it, right? We wanna make it at the conceptual stage or at the paper prototype stage where the only cost is tearing up a piece of paper. Um, if we can't do that, then we can build an interactive prototype. We can build an interactive GUI prototype. We can build an interactive command line prototype. Uh, after that, we start building code that talks to real data. We talk about an alpha or a beta or a release. And as we go farther and farther down this path with more and more development effort behind it, the cost to change becomes very, very high to where we release a point zero product out into the world and then the changes we're making are bug fixes, tickets coming back in. And fixing those costs order of the magnitude more than spending five minutes tearing up a paper prototype and making a new one. So the way that UX works the way it can work the best is if we get out in front of, if we get out in front of development ahead of them um, and try to solve some of these problems, try to remove some of the landmines, clear some of the brush and say, you know what, let's take this little path here instead of that path over there that looks attractive but I know has crocodiles farther down it. <clears throat> all of this, as I said before, and I'm gonna hit it again because I love this, all of this is about empowerment. All of this is about allowing the people who work on Puppet to make the right decision at the right time. You don't get great user experience by top-down control from a CEO or from a designer. Everyone's heard these legendary stories about Steve Jobs freaking out about this or that or the other thing. It was a story I read 
uh, a couple of weeks about him calling someone in church on Sunday morning saying the, the second O in the, in the Google in this tiny little icon is the wrong shade of blue and it needs to be changed. Um, and I'm sure that happens and it's very real. Uh, but the reason he can call someone in church on Sunday is that guy cares about it to begin with. Um, you can't call a droid or a schmo and have them just fix something, just do what you want. Um, if you have people working for you who care, who really know about this, and you can call someone and say, solve this problem. I don't really care how you do it. I just want it solved and I want it fixed. Um, <clears throat> so if you have people who are empowered to make their own choices, to make their own decisions about things, and see those decisions reflected in the product, and see those decisions have an effect on the lives of the users, that's when this gets really exciting. So <clears throat> how do we know this works? Uh, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you exactly what success looks like. My favorite thing about this is I had hardly anything to do with it. So do you see it? Now do you see it? Uh, this is the cloud provisioner in Puppet Enterprise. Jeff McCune is Jeff. Jeff McCune. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I emailed Jeff about this and what he said, and I'll read it word for word. I actually spent a few minutes thinking about what the user sitting at the keyboard wants to know while the program is sitting there doing something. Control will be returned to you in 10 minutes if this process is unfinished. How cool is that? What we know about sysadmins is we are ferocious multitaskers and we think we're awesome at it and most of us really suck at it, but we do it anyway because we get this shiny box of toys and we have 12 times as many things to do as we can possibly do. So we'll fire off a process and we'll go away and we'll come back and nothing will happen. Um, what this is telling you is that in a maximum of 10 minutes, I will give control back to you. It's a sevens love control. This is empathy. This is making the right decision at the right time for the right reason. And this is not something that a designer can do. This is not something that I can uh, just think about a bit and sketch out. Right? This comes from Jeff's knowledge of this tool, of how you need to interact with, what is this exactly? VMware. Um, and what the timeout might be and what the network layer might be. Uh, some designer might say, oh yeah, give it a 60 second timeout, that's enough, but you know what, 60 seconds is probably not enough, probably we do need 10 minutes. And the last thing that someone building this needs to argue about with a designer is what a good timeout is for a network-based tool. <clears throat> so if we empower people to make the right decisions at the right time, then we reap the benefits from it. And we don't need to control the experience, we don't need top-down management of user experience. We just need to build a framework. <clears throat> so while I'm geeking out on the command line here, let me try to quickly run through good command line interaction principles because I like to do this. And I'm going to play a sneaky trick on you, and I'll see if you notice. Um, the first thing is immediate feedback. Command lines interaction must provide immediate feedback. And this is what the cloud provisioner does really well. Uh, you get that feedback right away, it blows down to where it's going to take a while, and you get a progress bar, which I don't believe I actually showed on screen because I'm not animating this stuff, but you get a progress bar and it's really how long it's going to take. Um, even crusty old sysadmins like ourselves get nervous if we run a command that we're not familiar with and we see it grind away for a few seconds and don't see any feedback. We're used to some commands taking a while. Um, these tend to be the older school commands. You run CP and it takes a while. Oh, I know I'm copying a gigantic directory. Um, but if you're running Puppet, if you're running a pretty new tool that's written in, oh my god, Ruby, rather than real language like C, um, Lord knows, it's going to do really weird things. And half the time, especially if you're doing development on it, if you're using an alpha version, you don't know if it's going to work at all. So we need immediate feedback. You need, at very least, to tell the user that you've heard her and that you're going to take some action. <clears throat> um, I uh, once heard someone describe Microsoft Word as a friendly, retarded giant standing helpfully between you and your work. Um, <laughs> so we want to be helpful by default in Puppet, but we don't want to be too helpful. Um, so that's a line that, that, we're trying to, that we're trying to ride. And uh, you have to tell me how close we get. Faces is where we're most helpful right now. Um, and in Puppet itself. If you type Puppet and you type nothing else, Puppet, and you hit Enter, you get some help. And what we hope is that if you know nothing else other than your problem space and the command puppet, that you can get good use out of the tool. You type puppet, you hit enter, you get a reasonable um, entry point into the software rather than just some error like please provide 
foo, bar, please use our online help system, please use man, oh, I'm sorry, you don't have NROF installed, please use G and use something else. No, let's provide some help right away. <clears throat> readable output. Output must be human readable by default. Uh, programs exchange data very well between themselves in a multiplicity of formats, but very few of those formats are optimized for reading on a low resolution screen on a tiny little device. Um, you can use good graphic design principles, like uh, who's who knows, knows the acronym CRAP? It's my favorite thing. Uh, contrast, repetition, um, so I have notes, alignment and proximity. Um, you can use good typography. And I know a lot of you are thinking, command line, typography, graphic design, are you nuts? But you know what, you know what you people haven't seen probably? You haven't seen Nick Fagerlund's help for faces because the man does this. Um, if you look at faces help, it's a thing of beauty. Um, he cares about whether there's a period at the end of every sentence in a list of commands. Uh, he cares about exactly when something wraps and how something wraps. This is the attention to detail, and this is something that you can teach people through a long, arduous process in a monastery, or you can just hire people who have this built in. Empathy and attention to detail. These are the things that build great user experiences. <clears throat> um, I do have an English degree, and a little bit of me dies every time I verb a noun. But nonetheless, this is one of my favorite ones, actionable errors. Um, that is, when you see an error on the command line, you must be able to take action based on that error. This is consistently the biggest complaint to hear about Puppet, is that you get an error and it's completely indecipherable. If you're lucky, it's a Ruby stack trace that you can email to someone and say, please help me. If you're not lucky, it doesn't even look like a Ruby stack trace. Um, if something is going to go wrong, you need to provide people a good path forward. Now, it's difficult to do this, and that's why people don't do it much, because it takes a lot of time. It's hard to write an error message that someone having a problem will understand. It's sometimes very, very hard to chase down the code path to find where that error message took place. Um, but it matters a lot, and it matters a lot for people's frustrations. <clears throat> um, you should accept input the same way. Uh, if you have a dash dash key pairs flag that works for one command, it should work the same way for all commands. I'm going to go out on a limb here and add another slide for this principle um, and talk about nouns and verbs. Ha, that's big enough to see. That makes me happy. Um, this noun verb uh, command paradigm is something that people have been doing a lot lately. Git does this fairly well. Um, Using noun verb or verb noun is something that smart people can spend a ridiculous amount of time arguing about. I was eating a burrito in the park in May, like two days after we'd shipped the release candidate for faces. Sitting here chilling, it's the first time I've seen the sun in 70 days in Portland. And um, yeah, this is unusual, the sunlight. This isn't a tan, this is rust for those of you visiting. Um, <clears throat> and Luke comes by out of nowhere and says, you know, I know we just shipped the release candidate, but I'm really having heartburn about this noun verb verb noun thing, and I think we should change it back. Um, so, but right now what we do have is noun verb, puppet node install. And you could make an argument that it's easier to think about the other way, puppet install node. Um, but at some point you have to, well, at some point you have to make a decision and ship it, right? Um, but you also have to give, give some credence to expediency, right? Um, I'm not going to chase down the code path for you, but puppet install node is a lot more difficult to write. Um, it's a much more difficult code path because install is an action on node. You type puppet install and then you have to examine every possible noun to see if it has an install action. And why am I talking about this? Why does it matter for user experience? Because fragile code breaks. And if you have code that takes a long time and needs to iterate over a lot of data, um, you can argue all you want for the perfect user experience, but simple, robust things are a good user experience as well. So that's what we think we have here. Puppet, noun, verb, puppet, node, install. This is the way all of faces works. We have, uh, I think, 150 commands, roughly, in faces right now, including all the verbs. Um, and we have a bunch of legacy applications. I, and by legacy, I mean not faces yet, right? They're not in the new system um, that we hope to move over. So by some mythical point in the future, hopefully soon, uh, every command line interaction with Puppet will be exactly this way, Puppet noun verb. <clears throat> and a single entry point, SSH fails at this catastrophically. SSH add, SSH 
he, Jen, SSH, your mom, I don't even know what all of them are, right? This, I think, is terrible. I think this is a bad idea. Uh, from, you could argue for it for all sorts of reasons, documentation, blah, 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 but I still think it is a bad idea. If you have a single entry point to something like Git or Puppet, it's easy to learn, it's easy to think about. So here's the trick. All these things work just as well for GUI interaction. Every single one of these. They're just as important and in this order. And why is that? It's because we're building tools for people. And people are basically the same. <clears throat> All right, so we know the why. We know the how. Forgive me while I troll over here to my laptop and check the time. No, I don't see the time. OK. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about the what. Um, if you really want to know a lot about faces, I'm going to give you the dime tour. Kelsey Hightower is here. Kelsey Hightower is here. Uh, Friday, this man's talking about faces. He is a really, really cool face. And he's going to talk all about it. So go see him on Friday. Um, faces are us exposing things that Puppet could already do. Uh, Luke got frustrated that there's all this discovery and manipulation code within Puppet, and it's all buried. It's, it's hard to get to. But it's only buried under six inches, right? This isn't Mount Vesuvius. This is not 200 yards of, of lava on top of this stuff. All you need is a little uh, the dusting brush or a toothbrush to scrape off a little bit of dirt. And hey, look at all this stuff. So Faces is about exposing all this to people via a, a consistent interface. And in a matter of just a couple months, which in Puppet history is not very long, we managed to add, as I said, nearly 150 good commands to Puppet, which can be chained together at almost an arbitrary degree of granularity uh, by using Faces, this new API. So Faces is really cool. Um, a lot of you are probably using Faces without even knowing it. Uh, the cloud provisioner is a face. Um, all the new command line tools we're building are faces. And then there's cloud provisioner. The explicit goal of cloud provisioner, uh, and I'm saying cloud provisioner like it's a brand name, but it's not. I mean, it's a provisioner and mostly it works in the cloud. Um, the explicit goal of it was to spin up a node in the cloud running Puppet with a command set that you could print on a t-shirt and see across the room. So. We might need a big t-shirt, but still, this is a really tiny amount of code to type uh, in order to get an instance running out in the world. Um, and you have to wait a few minutes while things grind away, but you don't need anything more than this. Uh, of all the things that Puppet has built since I started working there, this is the thing that we use the most. People use this constantly. We use it for R&D, we use it for QA. Um, Cloud Provisioner is awesome, and bonus, you get to watch the friendly update messages while you go by. So <clears throat> we've done lots of GUI work in the last six months, which I find particularly ironic because one of the reasons I came to Puppet was to work on the command line and said I spend most of my time working in the GUI. So I can't complain because I love that type of work. Um, I'm going to give a dime tour. I don't think I'm going to spend much more time talking about this than Luke did. But what I will say is that at 4 o'clock today, me and Nigel, if he's still alive, and Jeff uh, and Dan and Dan are doing a demo of the new stuff we've got a Puppet in Puppet Enterprise. And we're doing that demo twice tomorrow. Excuse me. You can find the schedule for that somewhere. So come by and watch the demo. It's free. You don't need a DNA test or anything crazy. And uh, you know, blood samples are not going to scan your QR code and spam you. Um, so come by and see the demo because this is really cool. I'm not going to show it off right now. I'm just going to talk about it a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but what I will talk about in more detail are dashboard reporting improvements. Um, dashboard implies that it's a scannable view into your world, and this is kind of a problem because dashboard 1.1 was not very scannable. What I want to know when I'm looking at the front page of dashboard is, am I screwed? That's my first question. Am I screwed? That's what I want to know right away. And if I am screwed, how screwed am I? Um, <clears throat> And really what I want to be able to do is send this link to a manager so the manager can say, am I screwed? <clears throat> um, and Dashboard kind of does this, but it's got all this weird jargon up on the top left that you kind of have to do calculus and set theory to make any sense of. Um, and so we needed to improve it. And this is the improved Dashboard. So what do you think? Does this make you feel better, prettier? It's shinier, but the shininess is coincidental. The shininess is not the point. Um, there are a number of things we've done here, and I'm going to run through them. So first of all, we cleaned up the categories. This is the most important thing. The great thing about these new categories is they don't overlap. 
Um, the previous categories, they, like I said, it's set theory. I didn't even understand what half of these things are. The new categories do not overlap. The other thing is we have a little help icon. I don't know if you can see it very well at this resolution. This little question mark up at the top there. And if you click that question mark, you get a page on our website curated by the redoubtable Mr. Fagerland, which tells you exactly what all these categories mean. Right? So this is the first time I think we've put any sort of documentation into a Korean puppet. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we hope to do more and more of this. We don't have this built into um, the new work that we're doing it for compliance and uh, instant management, but we've got a month before shipping, so we've got time to work that out. Um, there's a graph. Uh, the stuff on the left here at the top is navigation, and it's also a graph. We're presenting information in three different ways, with color, with numbers, and with a little line graph, with position. So there are multiple ways to consume this information, and this is critical for user experience design, because different people approach things different ways. A sysadmin might be uh, more likely to see the absolute numbers and care about them. A manager might care more about seeing, oh, the red line is very short, and that means things are okay. We removed the big warning. I always hated this thing. This is my least favorite thing about dashboard, right? Nodes fail all the time. It's not a catastrophic event, probably, if a node fails. Could you imagine Google's infrastructure if every time a node fails, somebody got this gigantic flashing red warning sign? I mean, how much do they even care? Right? So with people with a tiny collection of nodes, maybe they care if a few nodes fail. If you've got a thousand nodes and a couple of them fall over, well, that's why you have a thousand nodes, probably. Um, <clears throat> so we nuked this error message, and it's now easily available. It's even a darker red, and it's just as noticeable. It just doesn't take up as much space. Um, we replaced the recent reports with this nice tabbed interface at the bottom. Um, we put a CSV export link everywhere. Everywhere you see a list of nodes, you can now export to CSV. Um, this is the best thing I think we can do for dashboard as a reporting tool is not try to solve every reporting problem with it, but allow you to solve your own reporting problems so everyone knows how to use Excel. Not to say that, ha ha, screw you, we've got CSV export, now we don't need any of the rest of the interface. We're trying hard to make it better, but nonetheless, if we can't give you the perfect report, at least you can give you the tools to write your own report. And lastly, we've got a background tasks uh, monitoring system. Daniel Pittman, I think, squeezed something like five orders of magnitude out of the performance of importing reports. It's so much ridiculously faster now, and part of it is uh, using this background task system and having a little monitoring widget for it. So this is, I think, an example of good design. And again, not because it's shiny, not because it's pretty or, or because we like the colors better, but because we stepped back and tried to think about what are we really communicating to people? What are they trying to do with this interface? How do they want to use it? Uh, and in what context. So we've talked about compliance, um, and I have much the same thing to say about it, so I'll skip most of this. Compliance is about auditing a set of resources on your systems, um, about seeing when those resources change, about being able to tag a group of resources to a known good baseline and being alerted when something is different or out of place. For instance, in just a few lines of Puppet DSL, you can tell compliance to monitor all of the users across your entire population and get notified when one has changed or removed. <clears throat> um, I have to tell you, we don't love the word instant management. Um, Scott Johnston isn't here, which is good. He's our VP of marketing, and he hates it, I think, more than anybody. So I will live to talk another day. Uh, even though I'm saying instant management up here. Even as recently as yesterday, we thought about saying live management instead of instant management. Um, but the fact is, it's not really a brand name right now. It's just a navigation item in Dashboard. And it's a way of using uh, M Collective and Puppet together to build what we hope is a very friendly interface to do really powerful things that are heretical, as Luke says. Um, so I'm going to give you a tiny tease of this and come by and see the demo if you don't believe me. Um, you can get a count of all the unique users across your entire population with one click. Uh, you can see all installed versions of a package across your entire population with two clicks. And you can make the root user the same across all your nodes with five clicks. It's really, really cool. And it's not until you see the demo that I realized, wow, we've got like half a dozen guys working on this for a couple months, and I'm showing it off in four clicks. I feel like a schmuck. It, doesn't, it feels like it should be more difficult because it's doing so much, um, but it doesn't, so come see the demo. 
So there's bad news. I don't want to stand up here and say everything's shiny and wonderful. The node classification in dashboard still kind of bites. Does anyone use dashboard for node classification? <sighs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's on the list. It's always like the third most important thing on the list. Um, and when we attack it, when we make it better, I want to do that for a reason and, and to do it well, not just to, to chip away at making it you know, 2% better and 2% better. I'd like to step back and re-examine a little, a little bit. Um, the other thing that we haven't made much progress on, uh, where I think by much I mean none whatsoever, is the forge. Uh, the forge is really cool. The forge is a brilliant idea. It's launched 18 months ago. And the actual GUI interaction on the forge I don't think has changed at all in that time, and that's really sad. And it's not as much that it sucked when it launches. It's when it launched, it's that any piece of software will suffer bit rot. Any piece of software that launches needs to be constantly improved based on feedback. Um, and we haven't done that yet. It's not that we don't care. Nigel and I talk about the Forge all the time. And he'd wave his hand and say, yeah, it's true, if he weren't you know, vomiting in the bathroom or whatever. Uh, but we care about the Forge. We want to make it better. We're actually uh, talking with the CloudSmith guys. Are any of them here? They said they were going to come. Bastards. Anyway, CloudSmith, check out their stuff, because Geppetto is really cool. They're going to be doing a demo of Geppetto as well. Um, but they are heavily invested in the Forge, because Geppetto talks well to the Forge and to modules. So there is some good news on the Forge, which is the Puppet module tool. Um, we haven't been completely lame with regard to the Forge, only with regard to the GUI. And actually, that makes me really kind of happy. I'd rather see the GUI language and have us build a good command line tool um, than the reverse. So my favorite, for those who's used the Puppet module tool to munge modules in the Forge, yeah, not very many. Okay, you really should. You should check it out because it is, it's really cool. With a tiny little command, you can snarf a module from the Forge. Now, the module tool does a lot of other things as well. It can help you build modules. It can upload modules to the Forge. But this was the workflow up until we changed it. And I saw this when in training six months ago. Um, Nan was doing the training, and he did a great job of, of keeping a straight face while he told people that this is what they had to do. But it's terrible, right? You download this module and it's namespaced with the username. And then the very first thing you have to do is rename it to the actual name of the thing it does, which is Apache. So we fixed this. Now, I don't want to break my arm patting myself in the back. For, I mean, I didn't have anything to do with it. Patting ourselves in the back, right? Because basically we sank a rowboat with a nuclear submarine. It's not like it took a lot of time to do this. But it's a little bothersome thing that costs everyone five seconds a day and just sucks. And this is quality, right? This is trying to remove these little burrs, these little irritating bits from the product. Um, and there's been actually quite a bit of work on the module tool exactly in this vein. Not a dramatic rewrite, not a, a big reinvention of it. Making the little things easier, making it a, a, a better thing to deal with every day. So at Puppet Camp Amsterdam, I had a, a a breakout session, a, a offline session on the DSL, the domain specific language. And uh, my favorite thing about the DSL was talking with Luke like six months ago. I said, this looks talking about the spaceship operator, right? Which I should have put a slide of the spaceship operator up. It looks exactly like the spaceship in asteroids. It just it makes my finger itch to see it. Um, <clears throat> and I said, it looks completely magical. And he said, it's not magical, it's arbitrary. Well, <laughs> So we had a great session about the DSL and got a lot of good feedback and a lot of specific things that bothered people and that didn't make sense. And I created tickets and I spammed the user list and then I completely dropped the ball. So I'm sorry, I suck. Um, every month or so, Luke comes by and says, hey, Mr. English Major, remember that DSL that we hired you to curate? What have you done with that lately? And I say, um, nothing. When are you going to hire me another GUI designer? Uh, and in fact, I have excellent news. We're hiring another GUI designer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it works. Um, we actually have three people doing user experience at Puppet right now, which is tremendously exciting. There's, there's me, there's uh, Peter Vanderbruggen, who isn't here today, but is the best front-end engineer I have ever worked with and is helping us do really incredible work. If you come and see the instant management demo, a lot of that is his work. Um, and I'm in a position now of feeling ancient. I'm 40, right, which is pretty ancient, right? Um, but I don't, I don't even understand some of the stuff that we're doing at a technical level. I couldn't dive into this and munch it if I had to. Um, so letting go, getting old, got to let go of things. Um, <clears throat> but one of the explicit goals of having more people doing GUI, two minutes, GUI interaction, 
is for me to spend more time curating the DSL and the command line and making these things better. Um, I'm only going to talk about one API thing, and Luke talked about that a bit. The thing that sucks the most about Dashboard is that it stores all its own data. I mean, there's the classic, if you decide to store data uh, in MySQL, now you have two problems. Well, it stores all its own data in MySQL. Um, and it's kind of dead, aside from Kelsey snarfing the data from it. Um, so what we hope to do with all GUIs in the future is for them to use a well-built web front end to just consume data uh, and to have along with that GUI a face that works with the API. <clears throat> So that's it. Um, I've done my time. Celine, do I have time for questions or am I just getting yanked off stage? There's, there's definitely time for questions. If you could come up here and speak into the microphone, that would be awesome. Or if you don't speak into the mic, I'll echo your question too. That's up to you. And also, I'm around the rest of the conference. I'm hard to miss. Please grab me and talk to me about this stuff. Um, without you, I don't have a job. <laughs> 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 All right. Anybody? Yo. The best way to learn more about M Collective is uh, to ask someone other than me. I'm sorry. <laughs> who, should people, who should people ask about M Collective? Uh, Ari's not here. Who to grab me offline? And who are you? I'm Jeff McCune. Jeff McCune, Josh Lifton, who might be here some. Josh Lifton. And Gary, Mike Stocking knows quite a bit about it. The uh, package. Yeah, Daniel Pittman down here in front. So yeah, literally anyone in a puppet shirt except me. <laughs> Kelsey. Uh, what's the best way to report the usability of that sucks? Like the code is bugs, you can just copy and paste that trace and open a ticket. Yeah. I'm willing that into screenshots. So what's the best way? You know, honestly, it, it, it's just. Oh, question? thank you. Um, his question was, what's the best way to report usability that sucks? Uh, and honestly, the best way is to be within 100 feet of me and scream. Um, I tend to hear those screams of pain. Um, but I, I, mean, I don't mean that facetiously, I mean that literally. You know, if, if you can find any way of engaging with me or someone else in Puppet, that's the most important thing. Um, and yeah, you can write a, a bug ticket with a screenshot and a you know, workflow to get your blah, 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 and that's all really nice and we appreciate it. But um, I don't want to put any barriers in front of you reporting a usability thing up to it, including the barrier of creating an account in Redmine. Email me, tweet me, I don't care. Just get a hold of me somehow. There is a usability category in the bug tracking too. That's true. There has been for a yeah. while and it's, it's being used more than like There is a usability category in the bug tracker. I don't mean to say don't ever use a bug tracker, but I do mean to say don't let it be a barrier. If you think, crap, I don't want to use a bug tracker, that's fine. Email me. Questions? All right, we got crickets. So. Catch me in the rest of the conference. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.